Welcome back to Wounded for War, guys. Today, we are going to be jumping right back into the series, Emotionally Healthy Spirituality. Today's session is session two. And uh, just the best way I can put this is hold on to your pants, man, because this one's a little tough. The, the subject is uh, know yourself that you may know God. The idea is we're going to look through 1 Samuel chapter 17 verses 26 through 45 and what it's going to do it's going to help us to understand that we have to to know God we have to allow our true self uh, to be known in a way that we understand ourselves. You see most of our life, we put on uh, expectations of others or a false sense of identity based on what someone said about us. And in this uh, account with David, King David, and, and, uh, and him dealing with the battle against Goliath, you probably have heard the story of David and Goliath. In that story, we're going to find how David's identity has been rooted in God and not in himself. And that will be the very recipe for his victory. But before we dive in, I want you to see uh, Pete Scazzaro, who put together this course. I want you to have his uh, summary of, of what we're about to dive into. And then I'll jump in with the study, and we'll, uh, we'll go through it uh, verse by verse. Check out the video. We began last week by looking at Saul and the problem of emotionally unhealthy spirituality. This week's study looks at David and explores what it means to know yourself that you may know God. This is the first of the seven pathways to an emotionally healthy spirituality. And why? Because an awareness of yourself and your relationship with God are so closely related. This is number one. So pretending to be someone we're not is so big in our culture, we rarely think twice about it. Politicians do it. Business leaders do it to generate profits and attract investors. Magazine editors airbrush photos to make their models look perfect and more beautiful than they actually are. It's just easy to pretend to be something on the outside that we're not on the inside. And students do it in schools. They wear other people's faces to fit in with friends and teachers. And workers wear masks to impress their bosses. And young adults do it to impress you know, girlfriends and boyfriends. And sadly, even in church sometimes, we put on a, we put on a mask. So certain people will like us or think of us in a certain way that we're holier than we really are. So all cultures have this. They pretend to be something that we're not to a greater or lesser extent. But in the church of Jesus Christ, God invites us to be our unique selves before him, to know who we are and not pretend to be somebody else. Now, we're actually called to be an alternative community, to be assigned to the world. Jesus has made possible a way of life that's unlike anything the world's ever seen. We bear witness to this power of God by living authentically and with integrity out of our true selves. So in fact, the challenge to shed our false self in order to authentically live in our new true self in Christ, this strikes at the very core of true spirituality. Augustine wrote this in his Confessions, how can you draw close to God when you're far from your own self? John Calvin wrote in the 1500s, our wisdom consists almost entirely of two parts, knowledge of God and of ourself. But these are connected together by many ties, and it's not easy to even determine which of the two comes first and gives birth to the other. The vast majority of us go to our graves without knowing who we are. Without being fully aware of it, we live someone else's life, or at least someone else's expectations of us. And as a result, we end up doing violence to ourselves violence to our relationship with God, and ultimately to other people. I know in my early years, the big focus uh, was know God. Everything was out there. It was nothing about knowing God inside of me. It was hear God outside of myself. And so as a result, for years, I didn't pay attention to what was actually going on inside of me. In fact, the verses I heard preached most were 
uh, verses like Jeremiah 17, the heart is desperately wicked and deceitful. Who, who can know it? Or, or Romans 7, in me dwelleth no good thing. And, and so it just led inadvertently to this idea of don't even look inside. The problem was that I was ignoring other scriptures and truths and missing a lot of what God was saying and trying to do inside of me. So I didn't do, for example, emotions, especially the, dif the difficult ones like, like anger, sadness, and fear. And I sure didn't know the implications of what those things were for my walk with Christ. But once I began to be aware of what I'm doing and how I'm feeling and how it's impacting other people, I began to ask myself the difficult why questions. So for example, like why am I always in a hurry? Or, why am I so impatient in this situation? Or why am I feeling so anxious now? And, or am I creating a life that's a gift to others or am I using them, trying to get other people to validate me and tell me that, that I'm okay? I began to look inside and ask, why do I dread this meeting that I have at 2 p.m.? Or, or why am I flooded with fear about this decision I need to make? Or why do I avoid confronting this perhaps difficult person at church? Or, or why do I need to have uh, all my phone calls immediately returned? And, and again, is it because I want to, I want people to please me. Anyway, I began to ask all these questions. And once I began to pay attention to God inside of me and to how he had uniquely made me, it opened up a whole new world to me. It, it was like a Copernican revolution. My relationship with God took on more listening. I began to pay much more attention to him. I began to give the Holy Spirit much more space to search out my heart. I became a more loving person to other people. I actually became a lot more genuine and true to who God had uniquely made me to be. And I began to shed some of the false layers that I'd been wearing. And in a healthy way, I, I began to realize that I could only be me. Now I could learn from other people, but trying to be somebody else uh, uh, was not doing anybody any favors. So this session is know myself, know yourself that you might know God. This is rooted in, in Jesus who models this beautifully for us. Because in living faithful to his true self, Jesus disappointed a lot of people, yet he was secure in the Father's love and in himself. Thus, you know, Jesus was able to withstand enormous pressure. He disappointed, for example, his family and his family's expectations for his life. At one point, his mother and his siblings wondered if he was out of his mind. He disappointed the people he grew up with in Nazareth. Uh, when Jesus declared who he really was the Messiah, they, they tried to push him off a cliff, but he remained self-assured in, in who he was, and regardless of the outrage of the crowds. He disappointed his closest friends, the 12 disciples. They projected onto Jesus a picture of the kind of Messiah they want them to be. Uh, they sure didn't have a crucifixion in, in, in their picture. And they quit on him. Judas, one of his closest friends, in a sense, stabbed him in the back for being true to himself. And in Jesus, even the crowds wanted an earthly Messiah who would feed them, fix all their problems, get rid of the Romans and work miracles. They wanted to make him a king. Jesus disappointed them as well. And then finally, he disappointed the religious leaders. Uh, they didn't appreciate the disruption his presence brought to their day-to-day -day lives and to their religion. And so they had to get rid of Jesus. And so we see Jesus, he, he knows himself. He has a deep sense of who he is before the Father. He knew what the Father had given him to do, who he was. At the same time, he wasn't selfish. It wasn't, it wasn't as if he was living as if nobody else counted. He gave his life out as a gift for other people from a place of, of loving union with his Father. Jesus had a mature, healthy, true self out of which he offered his life as a gift to the world. The pressure on us to live a life that's not our own is great. There's powerful generational forces, there's spiritual warfare that work against us, yet living faithfully to our true selves in Christ represents one of the great tasks of discipleship. So in this session, you will be looking at the story of David and his confrontation with Goliath as powerful forces come against him to basically smother his unique true life. In this famous story, you're gonna see the army of Israel is facing the, the, the great armies of the Philistines. And for 40 days, Goliath is described as, as, as nine feet tall and dressed in powerful weaponry. He, he challenges and intimidates the Israeli army and nobody wants to come out and fight him. And when the Israelites saw him, it says they all ran from him in great fear. And then David shows up. David knows who he is. He's not even in the army, he's a shepherd. He's an expert with a slingshot as a young man. He, He's not a trained soldier, but he's okay. He's not Saul, who'd led armies out as a general. He can't even wear Saul's armor. His older brothers put him down. Goliath curses him. But David somehow is, is it very secure. He knows himself and he knows God, who's made the heavens and the earth. And with that alone, 
David is able to break through all these barriers of discouragement. Discouragement from his families, his older brother's negative views, the discouragement of Saul, the person in authority, the entire army that's living in fear, even the curses of Goliath. It's really an incredible story. The knowledge of himself and his knowledge of God frees not only him, it frees everybody around him. He actually breaks through and everyone's able to follow. Now in the same way, powerful forces come against us to bury our true selves in Christ. Discipleship is yes, knowing God, but it's also knowing yourself. When we bring these two elements together, great power is released. As Rabbi Susia said, at the end of your life, God will not ask you, why were you not Moses? He will ask, why were you not you? Why did you try to live out someone else's life that was not your own? Part of your time in this session will be an exercise to pour out your heart before God and to feel. This is based on Genesis 127 and the reality that God has made us as whole people in his image. And that includes different components, a physical, spiritual, emotional, intellectual, and a social dimension. Now, allowing yourself to feel is an essential part of what makes you a human being and a unique person as a man, woman made in God's image. And, and it's essential that we look at this for genuine transformation in Christ. Scripture reveals God as an emotional being who feels. He's a person. And we too, being people created in God's image, were made to feel and to experience emotions. So for example, we see God beaming with delight in the book of Genesis, with joy as he creates the world. He says it's good, it's very good. We see God grieving that he has made humanity on the earth in the days of Noah. And it says his heart is, is, is filled with pain. We see that in Genesis chapter 6. We see God referring to himself as crying out and, and gasping and panting in Isaiah 42. And the same thing with Jesus. On earth we see him sorrowful and deeply troubled and overwhelmed with sorrow to the point of death in the garden. So we see a full gamut of emotions. So take a few minutes and reflect on the implications of the fact that God feels. You're made in his image. God thinks, you think. God feels, you feel. You're a human being made in his likeness. And part of that likeness is to feel. So if we're gonna do God's will, it requires, okay, first a complete commitment to do his will. Uh, we follow scripture, we seek wise counsel. But in addition, spiritual formation involves experiencing our feelings. Then we reflect on them and then we thoughtfully respond to them under the Lordship of Jesus. We acknowledge them as a part of the way God communicates to us. Not the only way, but it's an essential part. So getting to know yourself that you may know God is the discipleship work of a lifetime. Now let's begin and take the first steps on this pathway to an emotionally healthy spirituality. And let's pray the great words of Augustine who wrote, grant Lord that I may know myself, that I may know you. All right, so before we get started on this study, I think it's super important because we are going to be examining uh, David's life, but also introspectively looking at our own. Uh, we want to remind ourselves before we get started, as Pete said um, in another session, is that uh, some of these things can be hard. And so I found out that this week in preparation for this. Um, so I want to pray to begin with and just cover us and remind us that... <laughs> Our, our identity is now in Christ as we become believers, uh, no longer our, our old nature. So um, there's no shame. And, and that's going to be what uh, wants to creep up. But I want to want to uh, just make sure that we're covered in prayer in that area. So, Father, we come before you. And Lord, I humbly ask that you would please author my thoughts author the thoughts of people that are hearing this lord lord we give you our time and our and our hearts and our minds lord we, we want you to remind us whose we are and who we are because of that lord we pray that you would strip away garbage that <clears throat> has been placed on us thoughts that have been infiltrating our minds, our hearts, our lives, and, and bleeding out through what we do. Lord, it's been said that uh, our beliefs inform our actions. 
and we want to act more like you. So Lord, shape and change our beliefs about ourselves. Lord, I just pray that I would get out of the way. Lord, I am a, uh, a man who is flawed just like anybody else. And I just pray that, Lord, your spirit would use me despite my flaws. That you would use me, Lord, and, and uh, remove anything that's of me. And, uh, Lord, that you would pour in your Holy Spirit and speak loudly through uh, this time to each one of us. And I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. So... <clears throat> All right, let's dive in. We're going to start in 1 Samuel chapter 17, verse 26 through 45. So if you have a Bible or a digital app, open those uh, to 1 Samuel 17, uh, starting in verse 26. And I'll start with reading. Then David spoke to the men who were standing by him, saying, What will be done for the man who kills this Philistine? And takes away the reproach from Israel. Who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should taunt the armies of the living God? Notice that's a statement right off the bat where um, David's speaking out of his truest identity, his identity in Christ. He knows who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should be uh, should taunt the armies of the living God. He knows that God is stronger than anybody. The people answered him in accord with this word, saying, Thus will be done for the man who kills him. Now, uh, Eliab, his older brother, whose family, hears this. And when he spoke to the men, and Eliab, in anger, burns against David. And he said, Why have you come down? And with whom you've left those Few sheep in the wilderness. I know you're conceited and the wickedness of your heart. You've just come down to see the battle. Now, don't be surprised when the very voice that's speaking pain or hatred or, or, or things in your life that aren't who you really are uh, come from people that are close, near and dear, family, friends. Don't be surprised. That does happen, though it shouldn't, it does. But notice that there's a response when someone does that. But David said, what have I done now? Was it not just a question? It's like, dude, I didn't even do anything, right? But here's the response. Then he turned away from him to another and said the same thing. And the people answered the same as before. So sometimes when even the closest people in your life speak negative of you, one lesson we can learn from this right off the bat is you just need to turn away. Like David, he didn't accept what was given to him or was spoken over him. He turned away and went straight on to what his mission was. Sometimes we're going to have to do the same turn away from those voices that are being spoken over our life. Now, it goes on in verse 31 and it says, when the, word of, when the words which David spoke were heard, they told them to Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, let no man's heart fail on account of him. Your servant will go out and fight this Philistine. Again, he's speaking, David is speaking from his truest nature. Now, understand, this is a young man. He's probably in his age of like 15, 16 years old. He's a young kid. He's so, um, he's so uh, uh, just kind of a sideline guy that literally um, his family kind of just said, hey, go off and uh, just tend the sheep, man. And by the way, uh, being a shepherd back then was one of the lowest of lows jobs, right? And, and he's just, cast off but he knows david knows that god has a value for david and that's why he could say hey man uh -uh. all these guys have ran at this point from this goliath guy this nine foot giant you're our, the whole army of israel is running and hiding from this guy david raises his hand, hey I'll, I'll go find him 
because he knows God is with him. We'll see that in a moment. Then here's another voice again, another voice speaking negatively over his life. Then Saul said to David, you're not able to go out and fight this Philistine. You're a youth and he's been a warrior since his youth. Again, someone speaking something over David's life. He can accept it or he can reject it based on what he believes about himself. Now, here's where we get the foundation for why David acts the way he does. It comes from his belief, and here's where his belief started. In verse 34, it says, But David said to Saul, Your servant was tending his father's sheep. Speaking about himself. When a lion or a bear came, I took the lamb from the flock, or, or, sorry, and when a lion and bear came and took a lamb from the flock, I went out after him and attacked him. I rescued it from his mouth. And when he rose up against me, I seized him by his beard, struck him, and killed him. Your servant has killed both lion and bear. And this uncircumcised Philistine will be like one of them, since he has taunted the armies of the living God. And now, let's face it, at this point, just from hearing that, I went out and I killed a lion. I killed a bear. And, and man, who is this guy? I, I've, I've, I can, I've rescued my sheep. I, I got this. Is kind of what we hear right now. And, and almost you would feel like Iliad's right in what he says. Why? Because he sounds like an arrogant little turd. And that kind of sounds like Iliad's right. But his next words are key for the whole matter. He says, and David said, the Lord who delivered me from the paws of the lion and from the paws of the bear, he will deliver me. That's not arrogance, that's humility. You see, he spoke boldly up front. Dude, I'll take on the world because I've been delivered by my father in heaven before. And he has delivered me from a lion and a bear, something that no human should be able to go against. I got to be real with you. We live in a region where there's mountain lions. If one walks up to the front door, I'm not walking outside. David's the kind of guy that says, but the Lord's with me. And I've already killed one before. I can kill anything if God's with me. He will deliver me from the hand of this Philistine. <clears throat> And Saul said to David, go and may the Lord be with you. How do you argue with a guy who said that I've done the miraculous because God's been with me? He's, hey, I, I guess go do it again, right? Then Saul clothed David with his garments and put a bronze helmet on his head. And he clothed him with armor. David <laughs> girded his sword over his armor tried to walk, for he had not tested them. So David said to Saul, I cannot go with these, for I have not tested them. And David took off these uh, pieces of armor. What's happening here is Saul is saying, hey, if nothing else, I could give you at least what God has given me. And I have authority and I have this armor that's been made for me to go out to battle <clears throat> with the battles that I battle. And it's worked for me. It's kept me safe and as a king. So I'm going to give it to you. There's only one problem in that whole theory. Is that as David noticed, this armor was not fit for him. It was not designed for him. It was not tested by him. You see, <clears throat> Saul's trying to help. And people will try and help us. But they're going to try and give us the same armor that God gave them to go through a battle. And the problem is it wasn't designed for you. Each of our battles are, are uniquely designed for us. Our battles are designed for us because God wants to build our character. And if that's the case, then he's going to fit us with unique armor for our own battle. So David took off the armor that looked very flashy, looked like it was built, you know, a Sherman tank, right? He's walking it. But the thing is, it wasn't fit for him. He knew nothing about 
It's like sending a kid into a war with a gun and he's never shot one. He's not going to do well. So he took it off. <clears throat> Don't try and go after um, your battles with other people's armor. What armor are you taking on? What armor are you putting on? What armor do you need to put off that wasn't designed for you, for these battles? David, it goes on and says, he took his stick and his hand, uh, or in his hand, and chose for himself five smooth stones from the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag in which he had in his pouch. And his sling <laughs> was in his hand. Oh, boy. And he approached the Philistine. Can you believe this? He's got a nine-foot giant. And this dude's got a shield, a sword, javelin, spears. I mean, the guy's just, he's coming at him with full arsenal. And he's nine foot tall. David's probably five foot five and uh, a 16-year-old kid. And he's coming at him with a freaking fanny pack full of rocks and a sling. That's insane. But <clears throat> the Philistine came out and approached David with his shield bearer in front of him. When the Philistine looked at David and saw him, he was disdained. For he was but a youth with a handsome appearance. Now, we're going to hear another voice. We've heard the voice of his family trying to speak stuff over him. We've heard the voice of his leader. Now we're going to hear the voice of his enemy. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come at me with a stick? And the Philistine cursed David by his gods. Now, another voice. The Philistine also said to David, <clears throat> Come to me, and I'll give your flesh to the birds of the sky and the beasts of the field. Now, David speaks from his truest identity again. Then David said to the Philistine, you come to me with a sword, a spear, and a javelin. But I come to you in the name of the Lord, not with a sling even, notice that, not with stones even. He doesn't look to his weapon. He looks to his God. But I come to you in the name of the Lord of hosts, the God of the armies of Israel in whom you've taunted. That's huge, guys. He's not looking at his weapons. He's looking at the one who trained him for war. He's looking at the one who has carried him through his previous battles. Now, you know, David, his family, his brother spewed hatred at him. Suspicion, he slandered him in front of a bunch of people. The leader, Saul, uh, doubted him. He belittled him. And his enemy just spewed threats of destruction over his life. That's the voices in just a short time that are shouting at him, right? What got him through all that? What got him through without giving up? God shaped David's life when he was a nobody, when he was nowhere. He was just a boy. He was out in the, in the fields in an obscure life where nobody cared about him. And he felt probably as no one uh, did care about him, he, he was all alone with sheep. He felt lonely, he felt hurt, he felt bro broken, he felt discarded, <clears throat> kicked to the curb. But that's the very place that God met him, showed him his true worth and what he was truly capable of. He gave him opportunity in that wilderness out there to go kill a lion and kill a bear and know that God would be on his side. That. Those marks of identity, those big moments of God doing something radical for him, shaped him to where in the future of his life, as he came out this circumstance, he had the right tools, the right confidence, because he knew 
with an intimate knowledge, with a experiential knowledge. He knew God would take care of him. What situations or with whom do you have a hard time being yourself? Why? What areas of your life are, are you putting on a mask or, or living out of an identity where, you know, people have spoken things over you? What feelings come up when you're in these situations in life, these battles? And why? Why do they come up? It's because of what you've accepted or what people have told you, right? Something happened along the way when it shaped the identity that's deep within you. What does God say about that area in your life? What does God say about those areas in my life? You know, I want to share, <clears throat> I wanted <laughs> to share some stories and illustrations from the Bible. Um, but God kept poking at my heart and saying, no, share your personal story. I really didn't want to. Because you have to dredge up old hurts and past pains. But he wanted me to. And he wanted me to so much that I literally was kind of fighting against it at the last minute last night. And we, my wife and I sat down to watch a movie and she normally does not watch these types of movies. She says, hey, I just want to try something new, put on a movie. And it happened to be, um, what's that? Some movie about a dog and two orphans and, and uh, I forget what it is, but basically... The story goes, these orphans, um, this girl, the older sister of the two, feels a responsibility to care for her family, this dog and, and her younger brother. But she's living a life in a new place, in a new school with new people. And, and when she's asked questions about her identity, <clears throat> because she doesn't have parents, because she doesn't have, uh, her past is riddled with pain, and brokenness. Well, she tries to shape an identity that's different. And she lies. She tells them, oh, well, my parents are great. And they're off in Europe. And they're doing this. And that's you know, she's making up excuses. Because she hates her life. She feels no one will love her. Well, that was the moment where I knew God was making it absolutely clear that he wanted me to share my story. My mom dropped me off when I was two years old on a doorstep at a neighbor's house. Um, she had had drama in her own life. She was given bad tools. And so what happened when she dropped us off at a doorstep, me and my brothers and went to commit suicide. Thankfully, she was not successful, but that started a downhill spiral. First off, that's the very first memory that I have in my life ever. And I clearly watched her drive off in an ambulance. I remember the image of her laying on the bed, the pills in her hand, and the ambulance driving off. That's first marker or voice in my head. And that voice said, you weren't worth loving. You see, she was actually dealing with a lot of pain and hurt. And that was just all she could hear wasn't that she didn't love us. But that's what I heard and took away from it. And then, you know, I end up with my father and uh, my dad had been physically abused and that's all he knew in life. How to deal with kids that were unruly. So he was physically abusive. So much so that we ended up um, in group homes and foster care like this young girl. He didn't, um, he didn't not love us. It's just, these were the tools that people, my parents were given. They were given the wrong tools. And so the wrong outcome came about. And the repercussions were that 
I came out of my very childhood feeling, well, with an identity of feeling worthless and unloved. And because of that, uh, I needed, I felt, to make up reasons why I was worthy and unlovable myself or lovable myself. So I lied all the time about who I was, what I had uh, to people in high school and a few years after, I basically became a liar because I hated my reality. And I tried to change it, change my identity, anything I could within what I had. I didn't have anything. I was trying to fit in. I was trying to be someone I wasn't. Now, when you give God an opportunity, however, to reshape your life, uh, he'll reshape your life in a way where he shows you his plan for you and who you really are in Christ, who you've become in Christ. You see, you become adopted. You have worth. You become adopted into his kingdom and loved so much that he gave his life for you. He showed that not only I was worth being around, he wanted to be with me so much that he gave his life. He showed me how much he loved me. God can do this for anybody, for you, for me. God let me experience his plan for me as I surrendered my plan to him. He's been peeling back layers like an onion of pain and hurt and helped me to see in light of what Jesus has done for me that God has revealed his purpose for me and given me life and, and worth. He wants to do that for you today. He's, he's given us this series because there are going to be people who watch this message and need to hear that God has a plan for your life. He wants to breathe life into you, give you worth, and change the view of the past. So that, like David, when people speak new lives over your life, you're able to go to the next battle in victory because he's spent time building a new foundation of your identity, giving you new big victories over things. I'm convinced of it. The first step is just taking that willingness that you're feeling right now and saying, Lord, I need you, I want you, and what's been said over my life, I don't believe is true, though I live out of it a lot of the time. And I beg of you that you would change me, show me what your plan is for me, give me the ability to see your value that you see what you've created me for. Help me to live out of that identity. And Lord, show me the plan in which you've made my life for. In Jesus' name. We pray for you guys before we go. Father, I beg of you that whoever's hearing this message right now, Lord, that you would not let them remain in what people have spoke over their lives, what they've accepted, Lord, because it just got pounded into them. Lord, I pray that the pain and the hurts, Lord, that you would do what only you can do. Reshape, change, strip away all the things that have been said, Lord. Reframe their hearts and their minds by giving them a new identity in you. And Lord, show them it's not just an identity, but a calling, a plan, 
or that you have made them for a purpose, giving them worth. Help them to see that. Lord, I praise you and I thank you for changing my life, for peeling away those layers over the last 17 years of hurt and pain. Praise you and I thank you for what you're about to do for my brothers and sisters and new friends. In Jesus' name, amen. Guys, thank you for being with us this morning at Wounded for War. <clears throat> Our hope is, is to bring you hope through the message of Jesus Christ. We also want to help you get practical tools on how to walk in a new life that God has called you to. So I hope this was helpful. We're going to be starting with session three next week. So join us next week at Wounded for War. I love you. Until then, see you next time.